Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world, where it's naturally supernatural. Uh, let me ask you something. Do you feel satisfied? I mean, deep within. Are you really satisfied? I want you to know that there's only one way to be fully satisfied. It is by having the original glory that covered Adam and Eve restored. My guest, John Kilpatrick, knows how to be covered with that glory. Anyone interested in having your own experience with the glory of God? Is there a supernatural dimension? A world beyond the one we know? Can we tap into ancient secrets of the supernatural? Can our dreams contain messages from heaven? Is God ready to bring a tsunami wave of healing onto planet Earth today? Sid Roth has spent over 40 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. In a five year period, in a sleepy southern town, four million people came to one church in this five-year period. Of the four million people that came to this church, uh, 450,000 gave their hearts to God. I have the pastor from that church, the Brownsville Church in Pensacola, Florida. I have to believe it still seems like a dream. Yeah. I would, I would have to, I never said that to you. Yeah. But I mean, that just doesn't happen, John. I know. What attracted all those people? The presence of God. There's no doubt about it. When revival broke out that day, it's like we'd been praying two and a half years, and it was like the fumes were released in the church, like gas fumes. Now, I was told that uh, earlier, before this Father's Day, uh, it was uh, 1995, when, when the Holy Spirit just erupted, right. you had taught 10 lessons on the glory of God. What is the difference between teaching on the theory of the glory of God and having the glory invade that place? Well, it was like the f we had prayed in two and a half years, you know, for revival, and it's like the fumes were in the air, and so God sent the evangelist, and he was the match that God used for revival to break forth. And the thing that really surprised me about revival, I mean, you know, it's been called the Pensacola outpouring, the Brownsville revival, the Father's Day outpouring. But it was revival. I don't doubt that at all. But I believe personally it was a reintroduction to the American church of the glory of God. That's what I believe that it was. And, you know, all the old timers knew about the glory. They talked about dying and going to glory, you know, mm -hmm. and they, they believed in the glory, loved the glory. And today we hear a lot of talk about, and there's nothing that can top the blood. The blood of Jesus is the main thing. So what is the glory? The glory of God is the, is the weighty presence of the Lord. Now, I want to say this right up front before I go any further. There's nothing that can top the blood of Jesus. Nothing. Nothing can top it. But I will say that the glory of God is the presence of God, and it's what man craves. He wants to feel close to God. He wants to feel that presence. What can happen in the glory of God? I believe that's where the major creative miracles will happen is in the glory. When the glory comes in, I believe that's where the real creative miracles. I remember one night in Brownsville, uh, this woman started screaming uh, during praise and worship. And during praise and worship is usually when the presence of the Lord would come in to heal. All of a sudden, we're standing on the platform. You can feel that hot heat come in. This woman starts screaming. And <clears throat> she's staring at her husband. And I grabbed a handheld microphone, went down there, and whenever I got there, she didn't even see me come, didn't care that I was coming. She was just staring at her husband. Well, he was a Vietnam veteran, and they threw a grenade in on him. And he took that grenade and, was, and threw it out of the tent, and when he did, 
it exploded midair, but it blew part of his hand off. It blew all the meat off the tendons, and he had a crippled hand. Well, his hand was growing back in that presence of God. John, what is on this this greater glory that's coming? In fact, you teach about the former and latter glory what, from the Scripture. Tell me about that. Well, there's always been a former glory. You know, even when uh, Solomon went in to dedicate the temple, the Bible says that the glory of the Lord came, the presence of God came, and they, the priest couldn't even stand to minister. When the glory of God would come on me in the, in the early days of revival, uh, I, my eyelids would start closing. You know, I, wouldn't, I, I was totally conscious I could hear everything, but my eyelids would start dropping. And it felt like just a warm something came all over me. And whenever it did, I was just totally, 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 totally relaxed. And I would just lay over on the chair beside me on the platform. Or sometimes they'd put me behind the sound, you know, the soundboard. Whenever the glory of God would come in, it's so therapeutic that what I think is happening today in churches is that many churches are cutting down on their service times. And they're rushing people in and rushing people out. We're not giving God time to get to His people to let the glory of God come in. We've got to give God time to get to His people. And, and, and I believe that there's people that go to church every Sunday that loves their pastor and they love their church. And they're not disgruntled. But I believe that there's people every week that goes to church that's so desperate for the Lord that they go in one way and they leave out the very same way. They're not dissatisfied, they're just unsatisfied. But you need time to rest and to soak and to marinate in the glory of God. That's what gives you the strength to make it through the week. But what would it be like if the presence of God hung out in your home? Yeah. Uh, what would it be like if the presence of God went with you wherever you went? Yeah. What would it be like if that presence of God could be felt, Amen. could be seen, could be smelled, could be heard by non-believers when you come in their presence? We're going to talk about how that glory can hang out at your home. Be right back. Right back to It's Supernatural. Get ready to reserve your place on the Sid and Joyce Roth Appointment in Jerusalem Israel Tour, April 11th through the 21st, 2019. Keith Ellis, Diane Nutt, Kevin Sadai, and others will be on every bus with you, operating in the supernatural of God. Included will be a special Glory Passover Seder meal. The reservations are filling up fast. Call now for the free brochure. Specify the Sid Roth Israel trip or visit our website at sidroth.org Israel. Come experience God's presence like never before. We now return to It's Supernatural. You know, uh, you were telling me that all these people were touched so mightily in your church on a Sunday or, yeah. or another night. But then something happened when they went home. What happened? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when, when Revival first broke out at Brownsville, i had been there 13 years as a pastor before revival broke out, so I knew you know, what was going on in people's lives. You know, I knew people were on the verge of divorce, already signed the papers. You know, I knew mm -hmm. kids were giving their parents trouble and all Smile that. Smile on the outside, but what's really yeah. going on in this? So then when revival broke out, and we've been praying two and a half years, you know, and revival finally broke out, I began to see these people hugging and crying and reconciling and making up with their children, husbands and wives reconciling. And I was so grateful to see that. But then my telephone began to ring and people were saying, well, Brother Kilpatrick, you know, man, when we're at church, we're just, we couldn't be happier. We're so free. And then we go home. And by the time our car pulls under the garage, we're fussing and fighting like cats and dogs. So if I got one call, I got many calls. And I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, what's going on? And he said, well, son, he said, you prayed two and a half years in this sanctuary. The people did. And he said, it, it garnished, swept and garnished this atmosphere. He said, but when they're in this atmosphere, it changes their behavior. They're at peace. There's reconciliation. When they go home where all the fusses are inventoried and all the cuss words are inventoried, 
all the pornography is inventoried. When they get in that atmosphere, it changes their behavior again. And he said the atmosphere has to be changed. How can we make our homes ready for the glory? I think to repent is the main thing, and that's something to That's do. a nasty word I today. Know, I know. But if you want the presence of God to come, He's not going to come where it's defiled. He won't make His habitation there. He may visit, he may do something, but he's not going to make that his habitation. That atmosphere has got to be swept and garnished, and that presence will come. Just like when they dedicated Solomon's temple, you know, the presence came in so powerfully. And that's what happened at Brownsville when the presence of God came. The thing that drew people to Brownsville was not me or Steve, and I know for sure it wasn't me, and I know it wasn't Steve. It was not the church, it was not the city. It was the presence is what drew them. When people came and they felt that, it was tangible. They would fly for a day to get there from Australia and different places. And when they'd get there, it would be worth that whole day's flight just to spend an hour in the presence of God. Whew. Listen, when the atmosphere is right, you won't have to worry about the glory coming. It'll come. When the atmosphere is right in the church, when it's right, when it's cleansed and washed and purged, you won't have to worry about God showing up. He'll show up. The problem is not getting God to show up. He'll show up. But the main thing is keeping Him there when He does show up. You've got to work with the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve Him. You can't offend the Holy Spirit. But see, the Holy Spirit is a person, but the, the glory is an atmosphere. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's a third person in the adorable Godhead. But the glory is not the Holy Spirit. It is the presence of God, the manifest, weighty presence of the Lord. The glory of God usually manifests in two ways. In Israel, it would manifest when the priest would go in and take the hyssop and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Fire would break out, and that would be the tangible Shekinah glory of God. That would be the fire. That would be the visible. But the kabod, that's the tangible, weighty, satisfying, therapeutic presence that man was built to carry. I don't know about you, but my life's ambition since I've experienced the glory, and that doesn't make me anybody special because anybody can have it, but my life's ambition is to be a carrier of the presence of God. Yeah. That's what I want more than anything. <laughs> You know, when this man talks about the glory, it keeps getting higher and higher. But when we come back, there is a foundation for the glory that few understand. Most of us were cursed by the people that loved us the most because they didn't understand it. Yeah. Our parents, they're called word curses. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to amount to anything. You know, you know what they are. Well, there's a way to reverse it that few have ever tried. And there's a way to be blessed. And once you reverse the curses and walk in the blessings of God and clean out your house and repent of what you need to repent of, watch out. Yeah. The glory is going to overtake you. Be right back. Call now and get John Kilpatrick's powerful five-part audio CD teaching, The Blessing and the Glory. This is an exclusive offer for our rich Supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3321. On this five-part audio CD teaching series, Pastor John Kilpatrick shares two divine revelations. The first is on how to access God's glory and experience heaven invading your everyday life. The second revelation is on the power of the biblical blessing. John Kilpatrick answers the following questions regarding the glory of God. What is the glory? How is the glory different than the anointing? What happens when the glory appears? How can we prepare a place for the glory of God to reside? How can the glory be covering our homes, families, and churches? You will learn that revelation from the Father comes when you are in the glory. Creative ideas, problem solving, keys to unlock the supernatural of God are unleashed. Under the glory of God, you have no pain, no cares. You sense everything 
everything's going to be okay. It's the most peaceful, joyous, satisfying feeling that he ever had experienced. You can literally feel the glory of God on these CDs as John Kilpatrick teaches. John Kilpatrick unveils the power and the significance of the biblical blessing. Understand how the blessing is the way God chooses to transmit his power and goodness through the spoken word. You will learn how to bless your finances, your health, your relationships, and your future. You will find out how blessing Israel results in God's favor in your life. John Kilpatrick teaches how you bless yourself and bless your family, and how you can redirect your life through the power of the blessing. John Kilpatrick also prays a special blessing over you that will help you unlock the promises of God for your life. This is really a how to get rid of the curses, how to position yourself for the last greatest move of God's presence, God's glory in history. Don't miss out on getting John Kilpatrick's powerful five-part audio CD teaching, The Blessing and the Glory. This is an exclusive offer for our It's Supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3321. Call or you can send your check to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural. P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify offer number 3321 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today. We now return to It's Supernatural. Okay, uh, we're going to deal with some basics right now. But if you don't take care of the basics, don't look for the other stuff. you got a house built on a, on a, a faulty foundation. Uh, what is a blessing and what is a curse? Okay. Well, the way I came into it, I was 44 years old, pastoring Brownsville before revival broke out, and I just built an orchestra pit, and it wasn't functioning. You know, people wasn't coming into it. We built it, paid forty thousand dollars for the technology, and I announced, "If you play a brass instrument, bring it in." You know, for our dedication Sunday, nobody came. It embarrassed me after we put that kind of money in it, and people just didn't come. Well, I began to call it names like you stupid hole, you know, you expensive $40,000 hole, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, one day after the dedication was over and I, I had one person playing a trumpet and I had to pay him to come and play the trumpet. After it was all over and I was in the church praying one Saturday night, I, I was up there. I called myself praying, but I was whining and I said, Lord, there's nobody in the orchestra pit. You know, I was just crying out to him. And the Lord spoke to me boldly. He rebuked me. He didn't humiliate me, but he rebuked me. He said, well, stop cursing it. And that's the first time it ever entered into my mind that I, as a Pentecostal pastor, was cursing anything. Because I always thought about cursing as witchcraft, like stigmata, you know, and white magic, black magic. And so I said, well, Lord, let me get through tomorrow's service, and, and I, I'll get up first thing Monday, and I want you to teach me what do you mean by cursing, because I don't cuss, you know, and I didn't understand curse, because I knew what in witchcraft. So when I got to study, and the Lord said this, he said, you got to understand that a blessing is speaking out of your mouth anything that you want to see come to pass over person, place, or thing. A curse is releasing out of your mouth anything upon a person, place, or thing that you don't want to see come to pass. So blessings, and I, as I began to pray, and I said, well, Lord, show me. I was in prayer, and the Lord said, if you've cursed something, you need to do three things. And he said, you need to repent. That means to turn around and stop it. Don't do it anymore. Second thing is you, you need to renounce it. What does renounce mean? It means to ask the Lord to let you withdraw off of whatever you've cursed, withdraw that, and to re-say it. And then the third thing is to revoke means to snap the spine of a thing, pop it where it can't wiggle against you again. I called my sons home, and I said, boys, I said, I, the Lord showed me something through that orchestra pit, and that thing turned around after I repented, renounced, and revoked. It was full of musicians. It happened almost overnight. Well, you know, if someone were to do those three things and then the glory of God comes, do you know how those fast those things will oh, yes. be reversed? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so whenever I call my sons home, I said, boys, I, I'd like for you to forgive Dad. I said, I, I've spoken things over you that I did it out of ignorance, just like I did on the orchestra pit. 
So I'd like to ask you to forgive me. Well, Dad, you've been a good dad. I said, well, I ask you to forgive me. And I said, I want to renounce some things that I've spoken over you. And I did it in fear. So I asked the Lord to let me take what I spoke on them off of them and to re-say it and put a blessing on them. And then I asked the Lord to let's revoke this thing and snap the spine of it so it can't affect them anymore from this day forward. And so I stood there in my house and I, as their father, laid my hand on their face and I, that was the first time in my life I blessed something. I blessed my children. Now, when you say to somebody, you know, God bless you, it's good to see you, that's not, a, that's not a blessing, that's a salutation. You're not really blessing somebody when you say God bless you, it's just a salutation. But when you lay your hand on somebody and you say, I bless you, son, in the powerful name of Jesus, I speak that everything that has been placed upon you in fear, anger, or ignorance, I speak that that be broken off of your life. I speak that the Lord take the low places and bring them up. Take the high places and bring them low. Make straight the path of the Lord in your life. I speak that anything that has caused you to feel less than a fine young man that you are, anything that makes you feel less than the called young man to do the work of God that you are, I speak that those things slide off of you like a dirty garment and fall to the yeah, floor. You know what it occurs to me, John, is I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's important. There are many that are in our studio audience or viewing us right now that their parents have never blessed. Yeah. And I believe that you can stand in their parents' place right now yeah. and you can bless them. Would you, our studio audience, would you like to be blessed? <laughs> You're a spiritual father. You bless them as a spiritual father. Those of you that are watching, those of you that are here in this room, so many things have been spoken. So many things have caused you to be handicapped. So many things have caused you to halt in life. And right now, I reverse in the name of Jesus as a person anointed by God, one of the part of the fivefold ministry. I speak a reversal of those things that has caused you to halt in life and to be handicapped. I speak over you and I bless you now that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and that the glory of the Lord will rest upon you. I speak that health will break forth speedily in your body. When the Lord told Abraham, because Sarah couldn't have children, he didn't say, tell Sarah I'm going to heal her. He said, tell Sarah I'm going to bless her. I speak right now that those of you that are suffering in your bodies, physical maladies because of word curses that's been spoken over you, I break that off of you now in the powerful name of Jesus. And I speak over you that the blessings of the Lord cause your body to rally and make up for lost time, for the blood to flow where the blood has not been flowing, for life to come where death has been trying to take over. I speak where trouble and worry has been for the peace of the Holy Spirit to come. I bless you physically, spiritually, and soulishly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, you know John, I want to release you now because you've got to speak on the glory. I mean, the people, it's going to change their life after saying this prayer. Uh, so you, you can go to the speaking area right now, okay. and I'm, I'm just going to turn John loose and let him because the more he talks about the glory, the greater the glory will come. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of you, it comes on you so strong that you will be drunk on the spirit, meaning it's almost under anesthesia, and you'll, God's going to do some deep uh, surgery, a spiritual surgery and physical on you. And the more, remember, the more he speaks about the glory, the more the glory will come. To sit under the glory of God with John Kilpatrick after this program ends, go to SidRoth.org for this exclusive teaching after the end of this show. In 1995, on Father's Day, the glory of God descended on the Brownsville Church in Pensacola, Florida. When the glory of God came into the church on Father's Day, the thing that shocked me was when I hit the floor, nobody even touched me and I went down in the glory and I could hear everything. I was totally conscious, but I just couldn't move my body. It just felt like I weighed hundreds of pounds and it was the most warm, 
secure feeling I've ever had. Over 4 million people worldwide came to experience the outpouring of the glory during the Brownsville Revival. Hundreds of thousands were saved, delivered, and healed. Pastor John Kilpatrick has received a revelation on how you too can walk in God's glory and the biblical blessings of God every moment of the day. Call now and get John Kilpatrick's powerful five-part audio CD teaching, The Blessing and the Glory. This is an exclusive offer for our supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3321. On this five-part audio CD teaching series, Pastor John John Kilpatrick shares two divine revelations. The first is on how to access God's glory and experience heaven invading your everyday life. The second revelation is on the power of the biblical blessing. John Kilpatrick answers the following questions regarding the glory of God. What is the glory? How is the glory different than the anointing? What happens when the glory appears? How can we prepare a place for the glory of God to reside? How can the glory be covering our homes, families, and churches? You will learn that revelation from the Father comes when you are in the glory. Creative ideas, problem solving, keys to unlock the supernatural of God are unleashed. Under the glory of God, you have no pain, no cares. You sense everything's going to be okay. It's the most peaceful, joyous, satisfying feeling that he ever had experienced. You can literally feel the glory of God on these CDs as John Kilpatrick teaches. John Kilpatrick unveils the power and the significance of the biblical blessing. Understand how the blessing is the way God chooses to transmit His power and goodness through the spoken word. You will learn how to bless your finances, your health, your relationships, and your future. You will find out how blessing Israel results in God's favor in your life. John Kilpatrick teaches how you bless yourself and bless your family, and how you can redirect your life through the power of the blessing. John Kilpatrick also prays a special blessing over you that will help you unlock the promises of God for your life. I'm going to tell you something. The glory that's coming you will have a wall between you and the glory if you don't get rid biblically of all the word curses that have been spoken over your life. And this is really a how to get rid of the curses, how to receive the blessing, and how to position yourself for the last greatest move of God's presence, God's glory in history. Don't miss out on getting John Kilpatrick's powerful five-part audio CD teaching, The Blessing and the Glory. This is an exclusive offer for our It's Supernatural audience, yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3321. Call or you can send your check to Sid Roth, It's Supernatural, P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify offer number 3321 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, and this is Pastor John Kilpatrick. And uh, for most of you, you're familiar with uh, the outpouring in Pensacola, Florida, the Brownsville Church. Uh, he was blessed by God to be in the center of that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you told me, uh, not this time, but one time, that there was something that occurred before all that happened, and that is, I, I don't know how long, but you went by yourself yeah. every evening praying and mm. building almost an altar so that it would attract the glory of God. How long did you do that? Um, we prayed every Sunday night for two and a half years as a congregation. But I used to go down there a lot of times during the night. The Lord would wake me up, and I'd just get in my car and drive across town to Brownsville and let myself in in the dark, and I'd go lay on that front bench and just pray for several hours. What would you say to someone that says, I'm glad I don't have a prayer ministry? That's for the intercessors. Yeah. What would you say to them? That they don't have a prayer ministry? Yeah. That, that means they don't have a life. I'll answer yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but John, I'm going to turn you okay, loose, you. and I am expecting the visible glory cloud. Yeah. I'm not putting anything on you. You can't make yeah. it happen. Yeah. The visible glory cloud to come in, the tangible glory cloud, the smelling, the aromas of heaven, the hearing, the seeing, every yeah. sense activated in the glory. In Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. When revival broke out of Brownsville, it was the most remarkable thing that you can imagine. 
It was immediate. I mean, it happened suddenly. It was like the fumes had built up of prayer. It's like the building was filled with fumes. And when Father's Day came, Steve was the match that God used to light those fumes, and it just spontaneously came. But when it came, it was the most mind-boggling thing I've ever experienced. I never dreamed you could feel the presence of God that strong and get up and walk away. I didn't know if I'd really live. I mean, it wasn't scary. It wasn't phobic. But I felt like my body just could not bear up under it. And I was down for four hours on the platform, and nobody even touched me. And it felt like I weighed hundreds of pounds. And I remember right before revival broke out, we had built the building, and we dedicated it in 91, where revival broke out. And um, I was in over 200 meetings to get the building built, architecturally, financial, and actual construction. I was so stressed. And the church was just exploding. I was so stressed. I, had, I didn't have enough hours in the day. I had stress build up in my body that no pill, Advil, or anything else would touch it. And so when revival broke out, I had all these stress places in my joints that I couldn't hardly get around. I was like an old man. So when I fell that morning and nobody even touched me, I just went down on the platform. My eyelids dropped, my body just had no use for it, and I went down. It's totally alert. I could hear everything. But whenever I lay there on the platform, I, I didn't even know what it was. And I just got through preaching 10 parts on the glory of God. But I didn't even know what it was. And so when I said, Lord, what is this? The Lord said, he's got a sense of humor. You know, he said, well, well son, this is just what you just got through preaching on. <laughs> And I realized that you, you can preach something effectively and under the anointing, but until you experience it, you don't even know what you're talking about. You've got to experience it. And so whenever I lay there on the platform, it felt like, honestly, this is what it felt like. It felt like when I was laying there, it felt like something took me and pulled my joints apart. And I could feel water. It felt like fluid. And I know it wasn't. I could feel like fluid coming out of my joints and my knees, my neck, and my, sh my elbows, and my shoulders. And while I'm laying there, I'm thinking all of a sudden, you know, oh God, I hope they don't think I had an accident up here on the platform, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because it really felt like fluid was leaking out. From that day till this one, I've never had stress again. God. Never had, not, not one time. It just, it just leaked out, and it was that manifest presence that brought that release. And um, that's why I say, you know, we pastors are going to have to really begin to wise up and understand it's not what we think people need. We've got to depend on the Holy Spirit to show us what people need. Yes. I'm not here to tell you what you need. You need to tell us what you're looking for in church. And it doesn't just need to be about sermons. It doesn't need to be about worship. It doesn't just need to be about programs. What we're all trying to say is, Lord, we're, we're searching for your glory. Yes. We need to be touched by your presence, Lord. Well, when Jesus was here on the earth, he got kicked out of the temple. And he ministered there for a while, but then they kicked him out. They wouldn't let him back in. So he had to begin to go minister in homes. And when Jesus began to minister in homes, the Bible says that he called the 70 to him. He had 12 disciples, but he also had 70 others. And so the Bible says that Jesus called the 70 unto him, and it says, and I'm going to read it to you in just a minute, it says he sent them into every city and place where he was going to come, where he had invitations to go, but he had to meet in homes. There was only one temple, so now he's kicked out of there, so he had to go in people's homes. That's why when you saw Jesus heal the man they let down through the roof, that was in a home. He had to go in homes. He was kicked out of the temple. So Jesus called the 70 to him, and he said, Now go in these places where I'm invited. He said, I want you to divide up into two. So that meant 35 teams. I want you to go your ways. It said, The Lord appointed 70 other also, sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he was going to come. He said unto them, The harvest is great, the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. He said, Now go your way, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And he said, Don't carry purse nor script nor shoes, but don't salute any man by the way. But now listen to this, this is so telling. Whatever house you first enter before you go in there, and I'm going to add this. While you're still on the porch, 
first say, Peace be to this house. And he said, If the Son of Peace is there, when you make that proclamation, your peace will rest on that house. And he said, Go on in. He said, But if you say, Peace be to this house, and the Son of Peace is not in that house, he said, It shall turn to you again. In other words, it will fly back in your face. And what he said is, don't even go in that house because you're going to be wasting your time and mine both. I won't be able to do anything in there if the atmosphere is not right. And here's what he said. He said, if your peace remains, he said, in that same house remain. Eat, drink, whatever they put before you. The labor is worthy of his hire. Don't go from house to house. He said, now go in that house and heal the sick and preach the kingdom has come nigh unto you. Now, I have a question for you I want to ask. That's about homes. Reckon what would be said about your home if they came up on the porch of your house and said, Peace be to this house! Is the sun of peace there? Is the atmosphere clear? God works in a place, an atmosphere of peace. Yes. He has a hard time working where there's discord and disharmony. Reckon how many churches Holy Spirit comes up to on Sunday morning, and He's invisible, and you can't see Him. But He walks up the steps while the ushers are handing out the bulletins, and the hostesses are handing out the bulletins, and Holy Spirit comes up, sticks His face in the door, and you don't hear Him, but He says, Peace be to this church! And because there's so much hell in the house, so much trouble, discord, splits, fighting, Pastor against them, them against the pastor. This is going wrong. That's, and they got such rancor and division that the Holy Spirit walks out and says, I have to come back and try it again later. I can't do much here. See what I'm saying? But no, notice what Jesus said to these guys. He said, go on in the house. If your peace remains, go on in the house and heal the sick. Wonder how many people can't get healed in their churches because their spirit of peace is not there. I'm telling you, atmosphere is everything. Amen. Well, to make a long story short, and I want to tell you this story. This is one of the most important stories of my life. I preached on Mystery and Power of a Blessing. It's the most soul thing that I've ever preached, most popular thing I've ever preached. They've gone all over the world. And so whenever I got through preaching on this, the church got to where I'd, I'd speak a blessing at the end of the service. I wouldn't pray a prayer, prayer of dismissal. I'd just speak a blessing. So whenever I got through preaching on this, the church got to where on Sunday morning, if I'd forget and say, well, see you next Sunday, they'd stand there and say, mm -mm, bless us where you go. <laughs> so I began to bless the church. They began to bless me. The board began to bless me and my wife. It's hard for the devil to get in when you're blessing people and they're blessing you back. It's hard for the devil to get in. So when I got through preaching on all this, it was wonderful, and the church grabbed a hold of it. Brownsville got this thing. I believe it was the prerequisite, one of the prerequisites for revival breaking out in 95, because the atmosphere had been so purged and cleansed and washed that when the Holy Spirit came on Father's Day, He loved it and stayed. But anyway, when I got through preaching on Mystery and Power of a Blessing, I'd already moved on to something else. We still had Sunday night services back then at 6.30. Well, there was this guy in the church. He always looked thrown away. His hair was always disheveled. He was w really overweight. His shirt tail was half in, half out. He had a little bit of a scrub of a beard. He just looked thrown away all the time. He looked uncared for. So any time I'd ever get around him, and he went to Brownsville for years, and I was the pastor there 13 years before revival broke out. And any time I'd ever get around him, like at a Christmas party, whatever, he'd, he'd always disappear. He'd, he'd meander away. He wouldn't ever get up close to me because later I found out he was afraid of, afraid of me as a authority figure. So uh, when I got through preaching this, I'd already moved on to something else. Well, sun, one Sunday night, I was just getting ready to start Sunday night service at 6.30, and I, lo and behold, this guy gets up out of the audience and walks right up on the platform, and he says, well, hello, Brother Kilpatrick, just like this, and I was like, are you serious? <laughs> you know? And uh, he said, I just wanted to tell you, Pastor, he said, thank you so much for 
this message that you've been bringing on the blessings, he said, I'm telling you, it's changed my life. I said, well, son, thank you for coming and telling me that. You know, I was trying to start the service. And so he said, do you have a minute? He said, I got a story I want to tell you. I really didn't, but to tell you the truth, if it would have took an hour, I'd have delayed that service an hour, I wouldn't have embarrassed that boy because I could tell it was important that he wanted me to hear it. So I said, come up here and sit down. And he told me this story. He said, Brother Kilpatrick, he said, um, I was raised hard, really hard. He, he didn't mention his mother. He only mentioned his daddy. I think his mother must have been dead or left him when he was young. I'm not sure. But he said, my daddy was a vicious man. And he said, uh, he always told me, boy, you're never going to make it. You're never going to make it. You're a deadbeat. That's all you are. That's all you'll ever be. You're never going to make it. That's too much of a world out there for you. It'll overwhelm you. It's going to eat you up, gobble you up. You'll never make it. And he said he was just vicious. And he always told me, he always cursed me. With these, He said, now I know there were curses. He said, he always cursed me. So he said, I've been, I took in every one of your messages on mystery and power of a blessing. And he said, whenever I heard them, he said, it so touched me and so changed me that I wanted to go home and I wanted to ask my dad if he would consider blessing me. Because I've always said, your blood can bless you even if they're Christian or not, they can still bless you. So his dad wasn't a Christian. So he said, I got in my old car and he said, I drove up to Ohio. And he said, I didn't know if my car would make it or not, but I made it. I pulled up out in front of the house, and he said, when I pulled up out in front of the house, all the memories came flooding back and all the painful memories. And he said, I knew I needed to pull that door handle up, and I needed to walk up there and ask my dad, you know. And he said, but I just, I was so, my heart was pounding. Isn't that bad? Isn't that strange that you're sitting in front of your daddy's house, and you can't, you can't get the nerve up to go ask him to say hello, you know, whatever. So he said, finally, I just took the door handle and I just lifted it up and I got out and made myself walk up the steps and he said, I'm standing on the front porch, knock on the door. And he said, my dad comes to the door and said, what do you want? And he said, I hadn't seen him in about five or six years. And he said, he said, what do you want? Did I tell you, boy, when you left home, did not tell you that you're no good and you're lazy and you're sorry and that's all you'll ever be? Did not tell you that whenever you left home? What are you doing back here? And he said, well, Dad, he said, I, 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 I just wanted to come home and ask you if you'd do something for me. Yeah, I bet you do. You want money, don't you? He said, no, sir. He said, I'm going to church in Pensacola. And he said, my pastor just got through preaching a series of messages about blessings. And then he said, I've really come to realize how important you are in my life. And he said, I just wanted to know... Uh, if possibly, he said, I, you've said all the things, and they've come to pass to a T. Everything that you've said to me, it's all come to pass. He said, Dad, the only kind of job I can get is throwing papers early in the morning before somebody sees me. He said, I make enough money that I, I have enough money for a little bit of car gas. I have enough money for a little bit of rent, and I can eat. And I don't have any friends. I've never had any friends. I'm lonely. I'm dying. I've gone to try to get jobs at grocery stores and places like that, but when the supervisor or the manager walks in, I, I have a panic attack and I lose my breath and I can't even talk. And he said, Dad, all I can do is throw papers for daylight. That's, that's all I can do. I have no confidence. And he said, if you could just think of a few words that you could say over me, he said, it would mean, mean, just mean the world to me. He said, I'll tell you what, he said, if you'll consider it, he said, I'll go back and I'll pull up a chair in my old bedroom and I'll face the wall. You won't even have to look at me. Jesus. And he said, if you could just say, get your thoughts together and come in and just maybe lay a hand on me. You don't even have to touch me if you don't want to. But if you could just sort of maybe lay a hand on me and just speak a blessing over me, he said, it would really, really help me, Dad. So he said his dad just sort of dropped his head and didn't say anything. And boy said, I just sort of walked past him in the door, and I went back to my old bedroom, pulled up a chair, faced the wall. He said, I heard my dad start pacing. Just pacing up and down that hallway. 
He said, Pastor, we had an old floor furnace in the middle of the house there. And he said, I, I bet he went over that floor furnace 30 times, walking back and forth up and down that hallway. So I bet he walked over it 30 times. Isn't it something? When you're cursing somebody, it rolls out with an unholy anointing. But when you're asked to bless somebody, cat's got your tongue. Can't think of nothing good to say. So he said, he went over that grade of that floor furnace about 30 times. And he said, finally, I heard the door open. And he said, I heard these footsteps come in the room. And he said, my dad was standing so close to the back of me, I couldn't see him. But he's standing right behind me. He said, I could, I could hear his lips several times open and try to say something. But he said, it closed him right back. He still couldn't get it out. And he said, he was standing so close to me, he said, the first communication that I had to my dad was I felt water going down my collar. He said, my dad was crying. And he said, I heard him when his lips opened up, and he said, son, I'm so sorry. He said, I really do love you, and I'm so sorry. He said, I ask you to forgive me. And then he said, Brother Kilpatrick, he said, I heard my dad say, and I bless you. And he said, when he said, and I bless you, he said, the Holy Ghost came on that man. And he didn't bless me. He preached the blessing on me. <laughs> you know? He said, wow. He said, he said, he didn't, he didn't just speak a blessing over me. He preached it over me. Oh, my God, I'm so son, I just speak over you that you're not going to be like you've been. And you're going to do good in life. And you're going to be a handsome young man. And you're going to have a family. And, and, he, and I looked at him, and I see he dropped about 25 pounds. I said, well, you lost, have you lost some weight, son? He said, I lost 25 pounds. I said, you got that shirt tail tucked in, got that hair comb. Who's that girl down there at the end of that aisle? He said, that's my girlfriend. <laughs> he said, that's the first girl I've ever had, Brother Kilpatrick. He said, tomorrow I've got a job interview. And he said, I'm going to go sit down. I'm not afraid when that boss comes in. He said, I'm going to get me a job. I'm going to get married and I'm going to have children. I said, son. I said, I said, you mean to tell me, you mean to tell me that a blessing did that much for you? And he said this. He said, Brother Kilpatrick, when I heard my dad open his mouth and say, I bless you, he said, everything that he had said over me previously just sucked in and just fell off me. And he looked different out of his eyes. I, like I told you, came up out of the crowd, shook my hand with a good shake and looked me in the face. That's what a blessing did for him. And I just want to say this to those of you here today. You may be here, and your father may never have never blessed you, and he may be dead. Well, I want to tell you real quickly my story. It won't take three or four minutes. My father was vicious. He left us whenever I was 12. They separated when I was eight, got back together. But the time I was eight till 12, my father viciously used to beat my mother for taking me to church. She was his fifth wife, and he was married seven times, and I'm his only child out of seven marriages. But he didn't want me in church. He hated Pentecost. He hated the Holy Spirit. He mocked it. Didn't want a Christian wife, and he certainly didn't want a tongue-talking Christian wife. So my father was very, very vicious when it came to that. And whenever God gave me this revelation, and I began to preach it, I was sad because whenever I was preaching it, I thought, well, man, my, my dad's dead. He died in 89. Now, he died in 85, I'm sorry. He died in 1985, and I thought, well, man, my dad's dead. I can't even get my own father's blessing. But here's what the Holy Spirit said to me, and it so encouraged me. He said, son, that doesn't matter. He said, you have a spiritual father, Amen. Brother Wetzel. And he said, go by and get him to bless you. So one day I was at Brownsville working at the office. I called Brenda, and I said, Brenda, I'm driving to Columbus, Georgia. And I said, um, I'm going to see Brother Wetzel. She said, everything okay? I said, yeah. 
It is, but I just felt like I need to go up there and see Brother Wessel. And this was in 1989. So I called him up and I said, Rev, how would you like for somebody to take you out to dinner? He said, come on. <laughs> so I took him out to dinner and we fellowshiped. And when he got out of the car, I almost forgot. And I put my car in park, left the door open, left my motor running. And I said, Brother Wetzel, before I go, would you bless me? He said, well, sure. And so he was reaching up to put his hand on my face like that, my, and I took it and put it over my heart. And he stood there in his driveway and he blessed me. And when he blessed me, I felt warmth come over me that I know I would have felt if my own father had done it. I never saw him alive again. He died shortly thereafter in his sleep. But I got his blessing before he died. So here's, here's, what, here's what I want to say to you. You may have never got your father's blessing. You may have had word curses on you since you've been real young. But now that you're washed in the blood and you're a Christian, I want to tell you something. Those word curses have no more place in your life whatsoever. They're a misfit. They're out of place anymore. And I declare over you now in the name of Jesus, every word curse is going to slide off of you as if it's sliding off of an old skin. Just going to slide off of you and fall off of you like a snake shedding its skin. It's going to leave you. <laughs> Whew. Stand up. <laughs> Lift up your hands. I feel this. Come on. Shut up. Man, feel that, friend. That's the presence of the Lord. Come on. Lift your voice. It's okay. I don't dedicate children anymore at my church. Just remain standing. I don't dedicate children anymore at my church. I bless children. Whenever they bring their children to me to bless on Sundays, and I have a baby dedication, I don't pray over them anymore. And believe me, I still pray and I do, still believe in prayer. There's some things that you get from God by praying. There's some things you get from God by prophesying over. There's some things you get from God by speaking to. You have to speak to the mountain. There's some things that you only get from God by blessing. I touched on this just a moment ago, and I want to say this again. When God said to Abraham, Abraham was old now, and Sarah was well past childbearing age. She had never had children. She couldn't have children. She was sterile. Now she was almost 100. And the Lord said to Abraham, he said, he said, you're going to have a child. And he said, you're going to have this child through Sarah. And he said her name will be changed from Sarai to Sarah, which means mother of many nations. Mm -hmm. And what the Lord said was this. He didn't say, I'm going to heal Sarah. He said, I'm going to bless Sarah. Mm -hmm. Which has w left me wondering all these years, how many people are stymied in life because they have word curses on them, and it may be even affecting their bodies mm -hmm. and their minds. But the Lord said, I'm going to bless her. If you won't increase, you bless something. Jesus took the loaves and fish. He break it. He blessed it. And it multiplied. Yes. He blessed her and she multiplied and Abraham multiplied. If you want something multiplied and you want increase, you bless it. And so, you may be here today and you might not be able to have children. I want to just speak over you right now. I don't know who you are, or even if there's anybody here like that, but I speak over you, sir. If you want children and you're not able to have children, are you lady? I speak a blessing over you now that the Lord come upon your body and your reproductive organs, and that everything that may have been passed down to you, inherited 
and come down through the bloodline. I speak that as of today, August the 23rd, 2018, that it cease and desist in your body, and I release the reproductive powers of the Holy Spirit in you, and for a child to come forth from this union, in Jesus' mighty name. I speak that inherited diseases that's come down through bloodlines, all kinds of things that's affecting your health, affecting your well-being, even depression, I bind it in the name of Jesus, and I speak that every word curse leave you, and I bless you now in Jesus' name for life to come forth in you, and for that stump to begin to put forth new life in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. In 1995, on Father's Day, the glory of God descended on the Brownsville Church in Pensacola, Florida. When the glory of God came into the church on Father's Day, the thing that shocked me was when I hit the floor, nobody even touched me, and I went down in the glory, and I could hear everything. I was totally conscious, but I just couldn't move my body. It just felt like I weighed hundreds of pounds, and it was the most warm, secure feeling I've ever had. Over four million people worldwide came to experience the outpouring of the glory during the Brownsville Revival. Hundreds of thousands were saved, delivered, and healed. Pastor John Kilpatrick has received a revelation on how you too can walk in God's glory and the biblical blessings of God every moment of the day. Call now and get John Kilpatrick's powerful five-part audio CD teaching, The Blessing and the Glory. This is an exclusive offer for our It's Supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3321. On this five-part audio CD teaching series, Pastor John Kilpatrick shares two divine revelations.